Welcome to Breaking It All Down. I'm Count Zero. We're on to part three of the Runestaff series with The Sword of the Dawn. As with the first two books, I'm using art from the graphic novels to illustrate the events of the books. I am not directly reviewing the graphic novels. The two share a plot. I mean, the graphic novels are an adaptation of the books. And so I'm, I'm criticizing the plot, discussing the plot, but I'm not going to be directly criticizing the art. So if... so. If my mental image of the events or my description of what my mental image of the events is differs from the events in the graphic novel or how they're depicted there, well, that's because, well, that's what books let you do, is let you imagine the events for yourself. So, let's get started. Previously, in the Chronicles of the Rune Staff, Hawkmoon had saved himself from certain death by disabling the black jewel implanted in his skull by the evil sorcerers of the Dark Empire of Grand Britain. He did so with the assistance of the sorcerer Malagigi. Now, he and his companion Oladon now found themselves on the brink of death again, after the two chose a, in retrospect, really dumb route home, traveling along the North African coast of the Mediterranean Sea, which means they're effectively traveling along the Sahara. The two encountered a lost city, and a patrol from the Dark Empire in that city, led by Juliam de Ver. The two managed to escape capture again and helped the spectral residents of the city move it outside of this reality with a magical device, and they took a duplicate of this device with them. After surviving certain death on the sea, de Ver is rescued by Hawkmoon and Oladon while traveling across the Med back to Europe. On the way, they discover that Hawkmoon's beloved, Isilda, has been captured by the sinister cult of the Mad God, and de Ver joins forces with the two, along with the warrior in Jet and Gold, to rescue her. They defeat the leader of the cult and obtain the Red Amulet, which gives Hawkmoon great power in battle that will drive anyone except him mad if they attempt to use it. The party makes their way across Europe and discover in the process that Baron Melanatus is in fact still alive and is besieging Camargue and Castle Brass. Further, Count Brass has been wounded in battle and has given up hope for, of the return of Hawkmoon and his daughter and thus is fading in strength, as he has lost all hope. The party makes haste and returns to Castle Brass, restoring hope to the Count and ultimately leading him to be restored in health. With their return, Count Brass and the forces of Castle Brass push back the forces of the Dark Empire just enough that they can use the device that Hawkman brought with them to cause Castle Brass to slide through space and time to limbo. As our story begins... Castle Brass has been in limbo for quite some time, and in their absence, all of Europe has fallen to the Dark Empire. In Castle Brass itself, Count Brass, Hawkmoon, de Vere, and Oladon have become restless. Things change when Hawkmoon comes across a playwright from Lundra, the capital of Grand Britain. Elviera... El, Elvereza Tozer. I'm pretty sure I mangled his name. Tozer claims that he reached this land after finding a mysterious ring in the land of Yell, which I presume is Wales, a desolate wasteland where no men go, due to the events of the tragic millennium. The warrior in Jet and Gold appears and speaks of a similar ring that is in his possession. Both men receive their rings from a man called Mygan of Yandar, that's with two L's. Tozer had taken the ring to the court at Lundra to offer to the king, in hopes of restoring favor that he'd lost through writing plays that were somewhat critical of the government. He was not taken seriously, so he activated one of the rings which brought him there. The heroes realize that if Castle Brass is to remain secure, they must travel to Grand Bretagne to find out if there are more of these rings. As they only have the two rings in their possession, only two people can take part in this mission, Hawkmoon and De Vere. Meanwhile, in Lundra, Melanotis still seeks to capture Castle Brass and is looking for a way to travel to this other plane of reality or plane of existence where Castle Brass has taken refuge. His search for revenge has led to him becoming a laughingstock in court, and to have become nearly disgraced in the eyes of King Emperor Huan. However, Melanotis must put his plans on hold when two emissaries from the distant land of Asia Communista arrive in Lundra, with no warning of their method of travel. Melanotis is put in charge of being their host and to determine how they arrived here, and as much as poss he possibly can about Asia Communista so the Dark Empire can prepare to invade. The two emissaries wear massive suits of armor which, like the armor of the Grand Britannians at court, covers their faces, although this armor is of a radically different design. The emissaries confound Melanotis' attempts to discover how they arrived. They 
also draw the attention of one of the women in the court, Falana Mykosevar, who was disillusioned with the society of Grand Bretagne and is the cousin of King Emperor Huan. She ends up discovering the truth about them. The emissaries aren't from Asia Communist at all. They are, in fact, Hawkmoon and Dever. Falana falls in love with Dever, and she helps them escape and reach Yale, killing two guards in the process using a poison that only she knows about. On discovering the death of the two guards, Melanotis is convinced that all of this is caused by Hawkmoon, guessing correctly, but without evidence. Huan is convinced that it is a plot by agents of Asia Communista in preparation of an invasion. In defiance of his emperor's orders, Melanotis travels to Yell in search of Maigan, realizing that Tozer might not have been so full of crap as he and others at the court had thought. Hawkmoon and Dever make their way through Yell, with Melanotis and his pursuit party right behind them. They find Maigan, who recognizes Hawkmoon as the champion eternal, and tells him that he must seek out the Sword of the Dawn and the Rune Staff. After Melanotis arrives in Maigan's home, Maigan sends himself, Hawkmoon, and Dever off to a strange land, but not before Melanotis mortally wounds Maigan in the process. After burying their ally at a nearby settlement and getting a map to a map, they head out to the town of Narlene, where they are told that they could find the sword. On their way to Narleen, Hawkmoon and Dever are captured by the pirate lord Valjon, who makes them into galley slaves. After several days, they attempt to escape and kill many of Valjon's men, and they start to scuttle his ship until the pirate hunter Bouchard arrives, or Bouchard, to prevent them from being overwhelmed by Valjon and his surviving men. Bouchard talks, takes Hawkmoon and Dever aboard, although Valjean escapes. Bouchard takes Hawkmoon and Dever to Narlene and explains the state of things along the way. Hawkmoon and Dever discover that they have been sent not to Asia Communista, which is where, according to legends, the rune staff is supposed to be, but to Amarek. Bouchard also explains to them that Narlene is a city at war with itself, as it is home to a city within a city called Starvel, which is where the river pirates like Valjean live, while merchants and pirate hunters like Bouchard live in the outer city. Further, the pirate's religion is based around the Sword of the Dawn, which our heroes had come to get. On arrival, Bouchard receives an ultimatum from Valjean. Turn over Hawkmoon and Dever to them, and pay him for the loss of his ship, or he and his friend, family and friends will die. Bouchard refuses. The next day, while Hawkmoon, Dever, and Bouchard are going shopping for new clothes and equipment, they are attacked by Valjean's men. Bouchard is captured, and the shopkeeper is killed. Hawkmoon and Dever decide to break into Starvel to rescue Bouchard and claim the sword. On arriving, they discover that Bouchard is about to be sacrificed to the sword, and when they attempt to free him, they are captured themselves. Only the intervention of the warrior in Jet and Gold saves them from certain death. Hawkmoon takes up the sword and invokes its power to summon the Legion of the Dawn and defeats the pirates, cleansing Starvel of Narlene and the pirates and their grip on the city. As the book ends, Hawkmoon and Dever are preparing to leave by ship, while the warrior in Jet and Gold tells them that they must proceed south to Denark to receive, retrieve the rune staff. However, Hawkmoon intends to deceive the warrior and return to Camarg, and hopefully to that other plane of existence, Limbo, so that he can be reunited with the Silda. This book is very well written, and feels more cohesive than the last book. The last book was still fairly cohesive, but there's a certain degree of, I want to say, Chekhov's gunniness, where we have a vignette that introduces something that will come up much later, by which point you've almost forgotten about it, and other similar stuff. Um, but ev in sorry, bro. This book is very well written. It feels more like a cohesive narrative than the last book. Don't get me wrong. The narrative for the, for the Mad God's Amulet was well put together, but it felt like a series of episodes with small associations between them. Um, like a show like Babylon 5, where, where in the early seasons, episodes would build up small pieces of the larger puzzle, but you could still come in and watch one on its own and not miss too much. It, 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 I call it the magazine serialization mindset, where the book is written not as much to be ser to be published as one cohesive whole, though there is that intent for later on, as much as it's being published in a magazine to be put in little chunks to be read over a course of months or what have you, and then once it's finished, then it's put into a volume where you can book or can read the whole thing 
as it is. It it's, makes it easier where if somebody comes in in the middle of a serialized novel, they're not too lost. This feels like more... It was meant to be a novel from the very beginning and perhaps may never have been serialized at all. I didn't check on this. It may be entirely possible that it wasn't serialized at all. I remember that the first couple books, I believe, were serialized in the magazine, the British science fiction magazine, New Worlds. And I don't know if New... I'm pretty sure New Worlds was still being published at this time, but I don't think it, this book was serialized in that fashion. If I'm wrong, if it was kind of chopped into manageable portions and run over several issues of the magazine, please let me know in the comments. I appreciate your um, I appreciate your well-written and uh, research corrections. So, next time, we're going to conclude the Adventures of Dorian Hawkmoon with the Rune Staff, the final book in his little quadrilogy. I'll see you then.